I had finished my contract at the United States Information Service in Delhi when I met two Swiss journalists, Hans and Paul. They had decided to drive to Switzerland via Afghanistan. I persuaded them to take me along. Our transportation was Lulubel, a 1952 Chevrolet which had brought the two young men to India several months before. I looked forward to the adventure, even though they had warned me that it would be a rough trip into the unknown. The food we carried consisted mainly of a three-week supply of spaghetti and some cans of sardines. I was born in the free city of Danzig, which is Gdansk, Poland now. And I was born in 1925. My parents had been very successful in business. So in the mid twenties, they were able to buy a house with a beautiful garden. And I have wonderful memories of the garden and the house. The worst experience of my early childhood was early in 1938, when I came home one day and uh, my parents weren't there. And the help said, oh, your parents are on a business trip. But I thought, that's strange. Why didn't they tell me? And I noticed they were acting strangely. So finally, they told me, your parents were taken to prison. After three days, my parents were released. Three months later, when I came home from school, my parents were there. And they said, you must not tell anybody, but tonight we are leaving. It was a day that I was going to go to a party in the afternoon at our school. I had to play the violin. I had studied the violin. I wasn't terribly good, but I, nevertheless, I could play a little. And I was supposed to play at this party. I didn't want to go. But my parents said, you must go to this party because nobody must suspect that we are leaving tonight. I went to the school and I've never played so badly in my life. I never played the violin after that. So that night, we fled. Uh, we had a car. Our chauffeur drove us across I the took border. The train by myself. He'll help you to get to Switzerland. Across the Polish border, across the German border. Just across the border. Yes, it was suspicious. So I got off the train. Couldn't go to another country without a stamp visa in your passport. Thirteen-year-old girls did not travel by themselves. Asked me to uh, strip. My parents had settled in well, Belgium. On May 10th at 5 a.m., I woke up. We always we saw terrible noise in the sky and anti-aircraft guns. The Germans didn't know what had invaded. The train was just uh, Belgium, mobbed. Were just thousands of people crossing the border. Germans had taken Brussels, a town called Dunkirk, all the bombardments. And there was one place to another. Sleeping in barns. And then they would come with their stukas the plane, next to hit him, and he lost his leg. They are going to win the war. Uh, I felt that I did not want to have children. I felt that I, I felt the world is too insecure. I got a, something like an internship at the Library of Congress for outstanding library students, and I spent a year and a half at the Library of Congress. We were 12 interns from library schools of all over the country. The Librarian of Congress at one time said, now some of you will stay here, some of you will go out in the world. And I decided I go out in the world. <laughs> 
Well, my first job uh, I took, I went to Japan as a librarian, and then when I saved enough money, uh, I, uh, instead of going home, I decided to go, uh, take, uh, go to India. I was in India about a year and a half, a year maybe. I uh, met a lot of interesting people, and I met uh, some Swiss journalists, and then I went by car with them through Afghanistan, Iran, Turkey, and I was quite adventurous. There was a wide river, more like a lake to cross. The two Swiss waded into the water to find a shallow spot, then decided to try and ford the river. The car stopped. We pushed and pulled without success. Finally, after a couple of hours, a man on a camel arrived. He looked at the car in the water, made some noises and disappeared. Not long after that, several men on camels appeared with our savior. They leashed two camels in front of the car, and in no time, they succeeded in shifting her. Throughout our hazardous journey, the people were always willing to help, but would never accept any rewards, except perhaps a few Russian cigarettes that we had purchased. The Germans, you know, uh, that was part of their technique, to get all the people on the roads, the refugees, and then they would come with their Stukas, you know, the Sir German planes, fly very low and bombard people. Whenever there were these planes, we were going into a ditch. If we found the ditch, we would, uh, you know, just be right in the middle of the battle. And there, uh, one day, we were all in a ditch. Next to me was a man, I don't know who he was, and the shrapnels of uh, the plane or something from the plane you know, hit him and he lost his leg. And I was as close as I am to this and I was okay. Now we were walking on and all of a sudden a small car stopped and a woman waved to us. We went to the car and she said, come in, and, uh, I'm going to Abbeville. I'm the only bakery open in Abbeville, and I just was trying to get some flour from another village. So we were talking as we were in the little car. She said, you can stay with me if you can help me. So we moved into this little house, one room for the four of us. My brother and I learned how to bake bread, and my mother cleaned it up and cooked. But my father felt he had to hide. Now the Germans were in this town, you know. Meanwhile, all of northern France was occupied by the, by the Germans. Sometimes the Germans would come and we had to take the bread. They wouldn't pay. There was no the electricity no in line for three, four hours to get an egg or a couple of carrots. Or terrible. Whatnot. A German come uh, here. soldier. I think these people are Jewish. You do? I do not understand. Came. What do you want? If you are Jew, we will kill you. The whole town was evacuated. A big hay wagon left in a barn. The French farmers had fled. On the truck, the train stopped. And the Vichy bombs had started from one end of the false train. Paper. False paper. Checking the paper. So how to get to Lisbon? While in Kabul, our main activity was to find out how to reach the Iranian border. A Swiss engineer told us that he had been to Madari Sharif by jeep. What was beyond, neither he nor anybody else seemed to know. I went to the U.S. Embassy and told an official what we were planning to do. If you get through, he said, be sure to let us know, as we would like to know if any roads through the north are passable. I had uh, gone to Pakistan as a uh, actually library consultant, the only foreign woman in a little town. I had some colleagues, but there were men. Sergeant Shriver came 
because he was interested in the man that was the president of this Academy for Village Development for whom I worked. And he just brushed through there and looked at our my housing and, and then some of his um, lieutenants came and we spent days talking and I basically said, when I finished with my contract, I would like to work with the Peace Corps. So when I came back to this country, uh, you know, I joined the Peace Corps as a training officer and I spent five years and it was very exciting. I felt, the, uh, particularly after I heard Kennedy, I felt that I could perhaps contribute something to this country. The only place in Europe that ships went to America was from Portugal, Lisbon. But the problem was we couldn't get a visa through Spain. We went to a town called Lourdes on the um, north side of the Pyrenees, the French side of the Pyrenees, and then we got there, got a guide. Don't ask me how, I don't remember. My parents didn't want to talk much about it because there was always this fear. So one night, uh, with a guide, we walked over the Pyrenees. Very little recollection of it. I don't even know the route we took. All I know, in the middle of the night, it was very dark. It was uh, fall, so it was cold. I think there was a forest, that's all I remember. Just put one foot in front of the other, and we walked all night. The road to Peshawar was close to foreigners because of rumors of war. Only army vehicles and ambulances were allowed to travel. We waited until nightfall and zoomed through the many checkpoints. From there, the road to Kabul leads over the legendary Khyber Pass. I was thrilled to travel over the Khyber Pass, having learned about the violent history of this land route. The officials told us that the road was poor, a slight understatement. Every few miles, there was a sentry making sure nobody stopped or took pictures. All these ferocious-looking fellows carried guns. We bypassed the town of Jalalabad and proceeded to Kabul. Maybe partly because I became that adventurous. You know, I, I said that in the book. I felt I could do any challenge because I managed to survive. We walked all night. And then we got to a little place uh, in the late morning in Spain. We took the train illegally through Spain, and uh, the Spanish people, you know, these were poor people. We couldn't speak Spanish, so I don't know what they asked us, but they realized that we were refugees. Well, Jewish did not matter at the time, but they even shared their bread with us. Well, then we got to Portugal. And then we had to wait for the ship, and then we got to, to this country shortly, just a few weeks before the United States declared war. I had survived, so I felt I could face everything. It made me feel that I was invulnerable. I survived, you know, the war. I survived moving from one country to another. I never was introspective in terms of saying, oh, I did this because I'm that way or that way. But on the other hand, I look around and I say, oh, at least I've done it. I had a good life. I, I 
never really felt uh, that I was unusual, uh, but uh, I guess looking back on it, it was unusual for a woman to do some of the things I did. Sometimes I had problems, but I didn't mind, but because I felt um, it's one way to advance the uh, world of women. Even though I think tremendous progress has been made for women in the world, but there are still many problems. I've worked in family planning and population education. This is what's very important, to educate them. And we also found that they were empowered when they had jobs, you know, and even if they had children. Uh, but sometimes it was hard for them. I think I have touched the life of some people and this gives me, looking back on it, certain satisfaction. Part of it is understanding. And understanding people and have them understand you, I think that's good for international relations. So that's perhaps my unconscious overall interest. You know, there's always this hope <laughs> that maybe this will prevent war.